hope you guys got to it. But you always remember that there's those catechism readings assigned too, besides just the regular lesson to look at. And if you didn't get to it this time, that's okay. But try to look at those if you have time. To at least look at the questions and the answers because it helps a lot. And today's was all about prayer. So that was good. Prayer. That's what the readings was all were all about. It was talking about the start of the Lord's Prayer. And now this board is all not tight again. All right. So I want you to bring some with me. What's just like anything you know about prayer? Just throw stuff out there. Gay. Heart to heart. Talk with you know what? I should just draw hearts. Yeah, heart to heart. Talk with God. Ooh, that's a bad heart. Do it more like this. Heart to heart with God. Any other thoughts? You can just shout them out. Um, anything, anything that comes to mind when you hear prayer. Gaze of mind. Oh, heart to heart with God. Anything else? A way of comfort. Yep. Mm -hmm. It gives us comfort because we know he hears us. Comforting. Okay. Anything else? Hey, Charlie, good to see you. Just always remember we start at 6.45. I know it's earlier than the other people. It's because you guys get to learn more. Hey. When I was having connection problems. I, it, it, it wouldn't let me on. Two-way Two conversation. What do you mean by that? I couldn't get it on the big screen, so that's why you guys can't see the room. Oh, okay. So what did you explain two-way a little more? How does God talk back? Okay. And he might not necessarily whisper that in our ear, right? But he does that in, in the world, right? And then the other way he talks to us is through his word. So we, we see what God says and we pray, pray that to him. How does a little kid learn how to talk? A little baby. How does a little baby learn how to talk, Sila? Yeah, by watching and listening to their parents, right? So they learn to talk. Jesus' disciples, they once said to Jesus, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Why do you think they said that? Why do you think they said, Lord, teach us how to pray? Because before they did it, did they not know how to pray? Is that why they asked him? Yeah, right? Prayer is a learned thing. A lot of people think we can just, you know, we can pray whatever we want. And that's true to an extent. But Jesus teaches us to pray. We pray trusting in God's promises. And that's what the reading got to today, for today. So we talked about what prayer is. Gabe hit that right on, right? It's talking to God from your heart. And it's what we do because we believe in him. And then God reveals that he likes it when we pray to him. Do parents usually like it when their little kids come running to them and give them a big hug or they hate it? Yeah. They like it, right? So God, our Heavenly Father, likes it when we go running to him and ask him for help. Hello, come on. She was canvassing. She is more than excused. All right. So how about this question? Is it okay to pray to our dead relatives or to Mary or to another saint? See them? Oh, because they're not God. Right? God actually only talked about praying to Him. Uh, he's the only God. He's the one who answers our prayers. Psalm 65 said, You alone answer prayers, right? And so, what are some kinds of prayers that we like to bring to God? When we're talking about prayer, yell some out if you know some. Jessica, what's something you like to say to God? What kinds of things do you like to say to Him? You're going to say a prayer in the right now. What would you say? The first thing that comes to your head, what do you think? Would you ever say thank you? Yeah, that's one thing. We thank God for all things. Any other types of prayers? Do you look? Praise. Yeah, that's certainly one. He wants us to praise him because he's done so much for us. So, of course, we want to. Do you know what that is? Lillian's got one. She's help you. Sorry, Zoom guys. Just shout if you ever have one. Yeah, confessing, right? Confessing our sins, saying we're sorry for our sins. 
And, and the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. Very good. I think you guys got almost all of them. Lord's prayer is very good. Yeah, that's a type of prayer we should do. It kind of covers everything, right? Because Jesus knows what we should pray for. And that's the thing he taught his disciples when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Like we talked about, it was the Lord's prayer. All right, have you guys ever heard of, where's the eraser? I'm going to put it over here. Have you guys ever heard of this? Oh, the gas there? Yep. Adoration. Adoration. All right, let's see what else we got there. What, what's the C? The C of Acts. I know uh, Charlie and Dave, you can't see it, but I wrote Acts on the board. A C T S, the Acts of Prayer. Ethan, C is confession. So that's what Bill said, right? No, T is. But I'm sorry, Okay, I'm going to make it so you guys can hear me when I'm far away. I'm putting in an AirPod, literally. <laughs> Isn't that legit? Look at these. Okay, I know you can't see it today, but everybody's like jumping up on the on the couch tables. Charlie, Charlie, can you talk so I can see if I can hear you? Hello. Hold on, hold on. Okay, talk again. Buddy. Hello. Okay, good. Down, down, down. You already did it. Where did I put my marker now? Wow, they're crazy. Lillian, what's T? Thanksgiving. So, Gabe and Charlie, can you hear me even when I'm over here now? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. Okay. So, adoration, confession, Thanksgiving, and then the S of Acts is all right good tries good tries hey what do people say to each other out when they say they see their friends they say what what's what do they say jessica what's when you see your friend you say what's the what's up yep that was the hint max has it say it again max Supplication, yep. No, supplicate doesn't have an F. Supplication. <laughs> so that means that's just it's a big word because we can't just say asking because it's not an A in, in Acts. So supplication. So it's, that's asking for things, right? And notice how that's kind of the last thing because otherwise we always just want to ask God for things, right? All the time we feel like, Oh, God, I want this. I want that. But who knows us better than we know ourselves? Who does? Who knows us better than we know ourselves? God does. And he gives us and he wants us to pray. So one writer once said, if we were left to pray by ourselves, we would only pray the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer. You know what the fourth petition is? Give us today our daily bread. That's our favorite one, naturally, because we always like getting things. Don't take each other's pencils, please. Yeah, they just, we all, but remember, Brad talks about everything, all the things we want in life. All right, all right, let's be quiet, let's be quiet. Let's talk, let's go back to raising hands now. All right, cool. All right, thanks for reviewing prayer with me. And then we also, you also read a little bit about the first petition saying, he's our father. Remember we talked about that when you memorized that, how he is our, how, how we pray in this petition that we, he is our true father and we are his dear children. So we can pray to him like dear children ask their dear father. It's a special thing we get to do. But now let's get into the story. So there's actually a lot, a little bit less to read today. So that's part of why we were able to review the reading like that. So let's see. Let's get right into it. So you guys had to do lesson 11 for class today. Okay. Did everybody get it done? All right. Page to page 40 in your books, please. Page 40. Just thinking about Bethany get there too. Page 40, lesson 11. And looks like you forgot your book, Ethan. It's in the car. Do you want to get it? You just want to use this? All right, here. All right, page 40. Did you guys get to it? Sweet. Sweet. Good job. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate you. 
All right, cool. Good job, Sila. And then I know you guys probably talked about it, right? Which one was it? It was about the plagues, right? Or no, right before the plagues. Bethany, did you guys get to look at it this time? Not this time? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about it. Okay, next time, always make sure, talk to mom and make sure you get this one done ahead of time always, right? Okay. How about you guys? Got it done? Good to go? Lesson 11? So let's talk about the key questions of lesson 11. So how did, let's make sure this, oh, is it backwards? No, we're good. How did the Israelite situation in Egypt change from the time of Joseph? We jumped way ahead, right? We jumped way ahead to the time of Moses. Who thinks they know the first key question? Raise your hand if you know it. What changed? Sila. Yeah, they had a new leader. And what happened? What, what did that new leader forget? Or who did he forget? Better put. Sila. Yeah, well, a lot of the Egyptian leaders didn't really do that, but they for, kind of forgot who God's people were, right? They forgot Joseph. So that was the big thing. So they grew numerous. Oh, this is like what happened to the Israelites. So the Israelites, they grew numerous, and then they were enslaved. Because remember, the leader forgot about Joseph. So remember, Joseph was really highly respected in Egypt. You remember that? Because remember page 40, page 40. We're looking at the key questions at the end of page of that lesson right here, page 42. Yeah, so you remember how Joseph got to be in charge of all of Egypt and everybody loved him because he saved them from the famine, because he saved all the food for people to come by. And I remember all that crazy stuff happened. Max, I know you like some of that crazy stuff. Remember he snuck the silver into his brother's sack so that it looked like he stole it, stuff like that. Well, well Joseph was forgotten. So then Egypt, it got scared, and the Pharaoh's like, oh, no, there's all these crazy Israelites taking over our land. And remember the promise to Jacob? It was on your test. He said that your descendants will be like the what? Anyone remember? Stars. That was Abraham. But to Jacob, he said his descendants would be like the, think lower. Sand or dust. Yes, very good. Is that what you were going to say, Ethan? Yep, sand or dust. That's what his descendants would be like. So, the, so that promise is coming true. There's a ton of Israelites, and Pharaoh, the ruler, is really scared because he's like, they're going to take over all my stuff. They're going to take over our country. So he enslaved them, put them to work. So how did Moses end up being raised in Pharaoh's household? So he was, a, he was an Israelite. How did he end up over there? Let's go to someone on Zoom for this one, perhaps. Who wants it? Gabe or Charlie? Yeah. What's that? Uh, he was enslaved, but he was the best one to work there. Yeah, he was the best one to work there, Gabe said. So that was that was because of a very, very certain thing, though. Let me uh, adjust this so they can hear you talk, too, if it's possible. Eh, whatever. I guess you'll just have to talk through my ear, guys. But, yeah, so he was he was really fit for the job. For being, well, he was raised in Pharaoh's. Actually, no, we're not talking about him leading yet. So that's not quite it. So, how did he end up in Pharaoh's household? Sila, you initially raised your hand. What's your thought? He what? You said? Oh, gotcha. No, this is after that. So the went down the river is actually the answer, right? So he, his mother sent him down the river in a basket and Pharaoh's daughter found him. Because remember they were killing, they were killing all the babies, all the Israelite babies, boys, because remember Pharaoh was scared. So Pharaoh was afraid they'd take over. So the way to get rid of that is to get rid of the baby boys. And that way they wouldn't grow up any more soldiers things like that, but his mother sent him down the river in a basket because she trusted God, and then Pharaoh's daughter found her and raised her. That was that key question. All right, 
There's a little extra question here. So agree or disagree, it was wrong for the Hebrew midwives. Those are people that like cared for the babies. It was wrong for the Hebrew midwives not to kill the babies because the fourth commandment tells us to obey the people in authority, including governments. Go ahead. This one's probably your easiest agree disagree ever. Why? Why shouldn't they have killed the babies? Charlie. Um, because in the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shall not kill. Yes, very good. You made that connection. Remember in your, in your lesson for today, we saw the fourth commandment, which is honor your father and mother, followed by the fifth commandment. And they were both there. Why? Why would the fourth commandment be in this story? Any thoughts? This is a hard question. I know it is. Max, you got a thought? Gabe's raising your hand, his hand behind you. Do you want to phone him? Gabe? Yeah, very good. So it's saying we shouldn't disobey those in authority. Well, the midwives from Hebrew, they didn't listen. They stopped killing the babies even when the government asked them to. Because what... Charlie already said it. Which command? Yeah, number the fifth commandment. So we listen to God's commandments, or we listen to his command to honor those in authority, including government, unless they ask us to do something sinful. And that actually connects to your passage for today. So I'm just going to jump to it. This is your passage for next week. Okay, your Bible passage. It connects to this. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. So God wants us to listen to our parents, right? God wants us to listen to our parents, Bethany. He also wants us to listen to teachers and, and our governments. But if they ask us to do something that's against God's word, we must obey God rather than human beings. That's Acts 5. All right, let's get letter C real quick. So what did God call Moses to do at the burning bush? To rescue God's people. Remember, they were enslaved. Don't be so scared. rescue God's people from their slavery. Yeah, it's already up there. You guys can read it okay today, or should I share the screen? It's a little blurry. I can't like, I can't. Okay, yeah, I'll share it. I'll share it. I'll share the screen. Shouldn't be too hard. Well, never say that. Zoom just sometimes doesn't like to work, huh? Oh, it's doing that thing again where it puts it on the other screen. So I have to scroll all the way over to it and try to find my tiny little mouse. Oh, it's not letting me click claim host. That's weird. Oh, it's because it's back over here. All right, we're good. I got it. Just got to find the code again. All right. I should be the host any minute. In the meantime, while we wait for that, we already did this, the fourth commandment, the fifth commandment. Mo Moses actually murdered a fellow Hebrew. That's what we're going to find out today. All right, so slavery and exodus, Moses comforts. So let's get right into it. So let on page 43, I believe. 43. What? It's telling me my host code is... It's wrong. That can't be. All right. Sorry, guys. I don't know why, but it, it didn't take my host code. Yep. No, it's always the same. So I'll try to, I'll move it a little closer. Hopefully that helps. 
but otherwise I'll always say the answers too. All right. So let's begin by looking at the the little italics at the top like we off like we usually do. So top of page 43, can someone read that tiny little sentence? Max, go ahead. All right, so Moses is gonna go talk to Pharaoh. So I'll read the bullet points under the green print right here. It says right here, Moses confronted Pharaoh with God's commands. Pharaoh didn't listen. God sent plagues to convince Pharaoh to listen to his commands. Pharaoh still didn't listen. So yeah, if you've seen, if you've seen the queen of, or the prince of Egypt, and you probably know some of this story, right? And you maybe probably you probably heard it before. That's the movie version. Is that a Disney movie? I think it is. It's kind of inaccurate from the real thing, but it's not bad. Prince of Egypt. Mm -hmm. It might be. It might be. Maybe sometime we can watch it and analyze it for class. That would be fun. That would be pretty cool. Not oh, DreamWorks. Okay. Thanks, Bethany. All right, so what did God send because Pharaoh didn't listen? Plagues. That's what we're looking at today. So we need to go to Exodus chapter 7. Who needs a Bible? Who needs a Bible? Anybody? Bethany, Jessica? Here you go, Ethan. Exodus 7, please. I already got you really close. You can do the rest. All right. Exodus 7. Would you rather just listen? Are you going to actually listen? Are you going to actually listen to it? Okay. All right. All right, I'm going to play it. I'm going to play it on, on here again, guys. But if you can't hear it, just try to follow along. We're going to do it by section by section. So we're going to do the first plague section. 7 verse 14 to 24 and then so much like that but we're going to listen to it again all right here we go we're starting at verse 14 so i gotta jump ahead yes question exodus 7 Verse 14. Yeah, here, let me skip ahead one so you guys don't get as confused. We're looking at, yeah, 7 verse 14. All right. Here, since it's confusing, the place we're going to be looking for the different readings is right here. We're going to be going plague by plague. So, yeah, so actually we're going to do these plague by plague. So follow these because we're going to go plague by plague to listen to it, okay? Does that make sense, Ethan? We're going to go like this. You see these parentheses by the bold? All right, here we go. 7 verse 14. Let's listen to it. It might start at like 13, but. If there is hard the king's heart, he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes up to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile. And take him hand of the skin that was changed into a snake. Then say to them, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened, this is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. 
Instead, he turned and went into his palace, and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water, because they could not drink water of the river. Seven days passed. All right. So that's our first plague. So let's get right into the question so we can keep it moving. What was the first plague that God sent against Egypt? Ethan. Yeah, he turned the river into blood. Very good. God turned the water into in Egypt into blood. But were the were the Egyptian what's what were they called magicians? Gabe Gabe on here, Gabe on Zoom. Were the were the Egyptian magicians able to do the same thing? No. Did you did you catch that? They yeah, actually that part, was it a little too fast? Just a little bit. Yeah, the magicians actually were able to do the same thing. So it was kind of surprising. But yeah, by their secret arts. And we never know what kind of, there's other powers out there. That's something we could talk about right here, right? God is the most powerful and he has defeated all evil. But sometimes people can work with like power from the devil and things to do these, these up these things. But we're going to get to later where the magicians can't do it anymore. So the magicians were able to, do this one so what ended up happening so whoops whoa what is this so were were they able to do it they were able to do it you don't have to write the whole thing just say they were able all right and then how did pharaoh react to the plague Very good, Max. Yep. He said he hardened his heart. That's an important phrase. Hardened his heart and didn't listen. Good stuff. All right, we're on to the next plague. Now we're going seven, starting at seven. The last verse is actually, let's just start with eight right away because it's going to go right into eight. So go to Exodus chapter eight. Are you going to follow on this time? You want to? Okay. I thought that's why you're getting it out. All right, I'll slow it down a little bit. All right, chapter eight. Chapter eight. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down to the people of Israel and say to them, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go, so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and eating troughs. The frogs will come up on you when you are people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and for people, that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials, and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. The Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They were piled into heaps, and the land beat them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. Whoops, we got too far the into Egypt. The dust will become gnats. They did this. Uh oh, and spoiler alert. Egypt. Next one's gnats. All right. So, what happened in the second plague? There you go. Yeah, God 
covered the land with frogs. Imagine that. That would be disgusting. What do you think, Bethany? Frogs literally everywhere. Hmm. It said they were even getting into like their pots and pans though and stuff. All right. Could Pharaoh's magicians do this one? Yes, Charlie, what do you, what do you think? Were they? Yep, they were. They, they were able to bring them. So Pharaoh's, just like Max said last time, Pharaoh's kind of just like, thank you, Max, for that sound effect. Did you guys get that? That's the answer, right? Meh, on your sheet. No, really, it's he asked that God take the frogs away. And he actually did make a promise first, right? He agreed to let the Israelites go. But then as soon as the frogs were, go were gone, he was like, psych, <laughs> never mind. That's literally what he did, though, right? Yeah. And it's okay to laugh and have fun with the Bible stories. Like, that's good. Like, yeah. these, this is an absurd thing. This is like when someone says, like, does this ever happen at home? Like, you know, somebody just, like, promises something, and then you do the thing, and then they're like, nah, psych, never mind. That's what Pharaoh did. He promised he'd let him go. But then once the frogs were gone, he said, never mind, psych. All right. Everybody get at least the gist of that? Remember, you don't always have to write it word for word. In fact, it'll help you remember it better if you put it in your own words. All right. What happened at the start of this next plague? Because we just started it. Did you guys catch it? Just for a couple verses. Selah. It's already up there, Nats. Great. Yeah, I know. Nats. Awesome. All right, let's, let's keep listening to the Nats plague. See what else happens in that one. Now we're on to the third plague, the Nats. You guys all there? Exodus not 8? Yeah, we'll get there. That's actually going to be tomorrow. We'll talk about that. Are you guys following along in here? That helps you remember the story even better. All right, here we go. Back to, back to the middle of chapter 8. Shut his hand with the sand and struck the dust of the ground. Nats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became Nats. When the magicians accused Nats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the Nats were on people and animals everywhere, the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go. So I think we went too far again, huh? That was verse 19. All right. So that was a quick one. I'm going to ask Gabe Herman this next question. Because we got to make sure we know the story. This one's going to be easy, though. You're going to see the questions. They're going to have a lot of repetitive answers. Oh, come on. You got to be kidding me. What could Pharaoh's magicians do, Gabe? They could not copy it. So was that different from last time, Jessica? The magicians couldn't do it. Was that different from last time? What do you think? Were the magicians able to do it the first two? Yeah. Yeah, they were. But this time, we should have underlined that word. This time, they could not copy it. That's right. So that was different. So even though his magicians couldn't copy it, how did Pharaoh react to the plague? Ethan? Yep, he didn't listen again. He hardened his heart. Yep, he would not listen. It says, but Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen. So now we're getting into plague four. Let's get right to it. We're at 820. Let me post it. All right. That's all right. Just listen. Make sure you listen. If you're not following along, take it in. This is God's word. All right. Here we go. Here we go. So that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people, and into your houses. 
The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. And on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. And the Lord did this. Then swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's house and into the houses of his officials. Throughout Egypt, the land is ruined by the flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses said, That would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God will be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable to their hands, will they not stone us? We must take a three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God as he commands us. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. I'll pray for you. Moses answered, As soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord. And tomorrow the flowers will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Only let Pharaoh be sure that he does not act deceitfully again by not letting the people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The flies left Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Not a fly remained. But this time also Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. So what did Pharaoh say again? No. Psych. No. Basically, he hardened his heart. Oh, there's something I didn't point out before, guys. So when, when in the in the third plague, when Pharaoh reacted, did you guys catch what his magician said to him? In verse 19, his magicians, remember the mission to magicians who did it, they said, this, very good, yeah, he said, this is the finger of God. So even the magician who didn't believe in God started to realize, oh, this must be the true God. And Pharaoh was still like, eh, nah, I don't believe that. He hardened his heart. So he's doing this over and over and over. And now we're going to get to the fourth. And then we're just good. He is very stubborn, yes. All right. So what happened in this plague? What was it, Gabe? Go ahead. Just to prove the magicians. So what Pharaoh wanted to do is he was trying to see, like, oh, it wasn't this big deal that Moses made this stuff happen. See, it's not actually his God that's telling him to do this. Because remember, he was saying, hey, you have to let me go. We have to go worship this God. And so if this was the proof of their God that he turned water into blood or that he sent frogs, so he wanted to see if his magicians could do it too. Because if his magicians could do it, then he might think, oh, it's not actually from God. This guy is just a magician. He's just trying to trick us. So now that the magicians couldn't do it, it kind of was a sign that, hey, maybe there is a true God behind this, but the Pharaoh still hardened his heart. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yeah, he just wanted to see if it was something a person could just do without God. So what was the plague? Flies. Very good. Yes, flies everywhere. Nobody likes flies. Think of all the times you're just like swatting flies and you're going to out in the backyard, right? Or you have a barbecue. Imagine them literally everywhere to the point where they're blackening out the sun. The bed, the wait. Until they get covered their entire body. Yep, that's how crazy it would have been. So you can see why Pharaoh made a promise that he was going to let them go, but then he did it. So who was affected by this? So this is a different question than usual. It pointed out who was affected by it. Not quite, Max. Close. Did you catch it, Charlie? Go ahead. Um, isn't it, is it all the officials of Egypt? Yeah, just Egypt. Not even just the officials, but everybody in Egypt had it happen to them except Goshen. Goshen is where the Israelites were. Remember, that was the really special part of Egypt that Joseph got for his family way back when? Well, the Israelites still live there. It was really lush land. So the flies just like went around it. You guys ever see like those Marvel shows? Or like we've seen WandaVision. There's like that that shield. And maybe it kind of looked like that. Like the flies like couldn't touch it. 
But the Israelites, so they're just like living their day, right? The sun's still shining, they're enjoying themselves. They could probably just look across the block and see the just tons of flies bottom of the Egyptian. Probably, huh? Well, they couldn't probably. Well, they probably didn't want to be near the Israelites because they hated the Hebrews. Maybe some of them tried though, but they couldn't all fit in that area. Because remember, there was already millions of millions of Israelites that lived there. And good point, Lillian. They probably couldn't even get around. They probably couldn't even see hardly in front of them. There were so many flies. There were so many flies. Got to get English right. All right, number. So that was number eleven. So people in Egypt were affected, but God's people in Goshen were not. You know what? That kind of reminds me of your guys' passage for the test. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, right? So he's, is he, did he do a good thing for his Israelites who love him here? Yeah, he did. This is a good example of that. All right, number 12. I'll just give you this one. So again, he did the sight thing, right? Maybe a good way to remember that is he literally right sight under your question, right? He agreed to let God's people go. Sure, there you go. But when the flies were gone, he again changed his mind. He, whatever. But yeah, again. Go ahead. All right, we're just going to talk about the next one instead of reading. Because we've kind of seen the pattern now, okay? We've kind of seen the pattern. So let's talk about the next one. So, the fifth play. Does anyone remember? Good guess, not quite yet. All the cattle died? Yeah, that's it. Isn't that the game saying that? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah, right. It's livestock. Very good. Yeah, you did, but you said boils first. And I heard them. But uh, my Bible's on if I go on. All right. So, yeah, the plague of livestock. So, all of them died in Egypt. So, that's the next one. All the livestock died in Egypt. So, this in the Bible, it was the same kind of thing as the other ones, right? He, he went to. He, the livestock? You mean like the animals? Yes. Well, God created them, yeah, but he killed the Egyptian livestock. You think back then, livestock was like money for them. Yeah, and right? God. So Jesus took that, or God took that away from them. Yeah, he, he ripped all his food. So it was the same as usual. He went to Pharaoh and said, hey, let my people go. Let my people go. This is, and otherwise your livestock are going to die. And it happened. Who was affected by the plague? Got a guess? And where were they affected? Whoever answered that question. In Goshen. Very good. Moses, um, Gabe and Charlie as well. So yeah, the Egyptians were affected. The Israelites were not. And then what do you guys think? You can probably guess number 15. How did Pharaoh react? He hardened his heart. Yep, it says this time his heart was unyielding. So it was just stony. It was hard. But he actually did another thing this time. It says he investigated to see if the livestock of God's people had died. But he still wouldn't let them go. investigation. Yeah, he wanted to see. He's like, all right, maybe if God had time, maybe his, is he also hurting his own people? God wouldn't do that, would he? So he went and checked. And sure enough, the people that claimed to have the Lord as their God didn't have the livestock killed. So Pharaoh should have been like, whoa, okay, this God is real. He looks out for his people. But instead, Pharaoh was like, I'm not letting him go. And he said, psych. He didn't really say psych this time, though, because he didn't promise this time. He just wouldn't let him go. All right, let's get to the next one. Number six. 
I know he is. This time, I want you guys really to focus. It's going to be easy for the first two, but it's going to be a little different on the third, okay? God sent boils. There you go, Max. Good job. So in the, this one, imagine that, okay? Think of how much. So boils are kind of like these disgusting, sickly growths on your skin. Think of like a wart and a zit. Those are like kind of like something between that, okay? No, no. It would be really painful and it would fester like four boot out and stuff. Just to be honest with you. Super cool stuff, right? So you know, yummy. Nothing better than some goo coming out of your ears. That's just the best. <laughs> so yeah, that's what was going on. And everybody was affected by it. All the Egyptians were affected by it. So this would have been a hard thing. So imagine the pain Pharaoh's in this time, right? He's probably like in tons of pain. Because imagine if you have these boils and sores all over you, you can't even sit down comfortably. Think of how when you get a really bad sunburn, you can't sleep, right? Because you don't know like where to lay, like it hurts everywhere. Well, think about how that'd be with the boils. So Pharaoh, you'd think maybe you would be better this time? What do you think? Better. All right, let's read Exodus 9, verse 12. I'm going to read it for you if you want to follow along with me. Exodus 9, verse 12. This is how Pharaoh reacted to this one, or what it says about Pharaoh, I should say. Got to find it. Here it is. This time it says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Just as the Lord had said to Moses. So what's the difference this time? That's what the Bible says. Isn't that crazy? Nope. So there's a lesson to be had there. But first, first. First, write this down. Gabe, you just missed the, the plot twist. So we've been answering every time that Pharaoh, now it is. Every time Pharaoh pardoned his heart, right? But then suddenly we get to the end of the sixth play. And now it's God that does it. It's Exodus 9, verse 12 says, The Lord pardoned Pharaoh's heart. So I want you to relax for a sec, take that in. Make sure you write that down. It's important. Maybe underline God and put a star by the question so that you know it's different than all the others. That way, when you're reviewing it for a test, you don't just fly by because this weapon is immediately a fly by. You're like, oh, I know what I have to do with plagues. Pharaoh says, try to be harder than his heart, blah, blah, blah. But you get to the end of plague number six and you realize, oh, this is different. This is God did it now. All right. All right, focus up. There's a lesson in this. Let's talk about it. So, if God hardened his heart, then did God choose for Pharaoh to lose his faith? What do you think? Don't answer right away. Think about it for a few seconds. Did God choose for Pharaoh to lose his faith? What do you think? We'll make that an agree disagree. God chose for Pharaoh to lose his faith. Put your thumb up if you think that's true. Thumb down if you think it's false. I'm not going sideways. I'm just putting it like this. What do you guys think? I see some thumbs down. I see some unknowns. What do you guys got on Zoom? Gabe, I can't quite see your thumb. You got a sideways? It's tough. I see a lot of downs. So why do you have down, down thumb? Why didn't I do this? Gabe, Herman? Um, it's a hard. Would you guys admit this is a hard question? Yes. Okay, Sila? Very good. There's that verse in First Timothy 2 that says, God wants all people to be saved. 
Do you guys remember? Look at page back one. We got all of these plagues over and over, and you guys predicted every time what happened, right? Pharaoh said, right? Pharaoh did it. Pharaoh did it. Listen. Yeah, right. How many did he do? He did like five of them to be exact. He said, exactly. Who did that? Pharaoh did. Who did the judge? You see what I'm doing? Pharaoh chose to deny God over and over and over. And this is a real warning for us, guys. When we keep choosing to deny God and say, nope, God, you don't exist, or God, what you say isn't good. Nope, I'm going to choose my own way. Eventually, God says, okay, have it your way. And he then does the hardening. And then we're beyond hope. So now Pharaoh is beyond hope. There's nothing that he can do. And, and, and actually, God predicted this. We don't have to read this right now. But he said before the plagues even started that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But that was only because God knows all things that are going to happen. So he knew that Pharaoh was going to choose to say, and choose to say, yes. But he kept hardening in his heart. So eventually God said, if that's what you want, I've made it utterly clear clear that I am real. Yes, Celia, you have a question? What? Hold on, Bethany. Hold on. Seals seals asking. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a really deep question. Yeah, so she asked, if God knows all things like this, why did she, he even let the devil come into the garden and tempt them and all that? That's a, that's a difficult one, and the Bible doesn't really say a lot about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good, Lillian. Yeah, wait, wait, let me. Yep, yep, everything happens for a reason. We talked last unit about how God works even through evil. He doesn't cause evil, but he works through evil. So like Lillian said, that's the good first place to start. There are some things that are just too wonderful for us to understand. That's how a psalm puts it. Like, we just can't understand it. Just wait, I just, can I, I just give a little bit of a goal first. So it's. So it's like so far beyond us. And maybe it's something we just can't comprehend is how could evil be allowed? But one thing was that God wanted people to have choice in the Garden of Eden. And think about it. If they didn't have the choice to worship God by, at the tree of life by not eating from the knowledge of tree of evil, good and knowledge of good and evil, they'd basically just be robots. If they were forced to be perfect, and do everything God said. They'd just be like God's little playthings, right? Moving around. But God didn't want that. He wanted them to be able to choose to love him. That was like their worship. Like their coming to church was not eating from that tree. And so we don't know why God allowed Satan. Maybe for a chance for them to obey God instead of Satan. To show him love. But sadly they fell in. And you might still think, oh, but, but, but still, why did he let him if he knew it was going to? Well, otherwise it would have been them being like robots, but that's just a thought, Sila. We don't know for sure. The Bible doesn't talk about it, but what do we what do we know about God? Well, we know he's good. We know he's loving, and he knows he has our best interest in mind. So we can be confident that even the devil having this, allowing him to come was still with the best interest of us in mind. Yes, Lillian? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, but from our perspective, we still have the ability to make choices and things with things in our world. Like you decided to put on a Lilo and Stitch shirt. Today. God didn't whisper in your ear and say, hey, I think you should really wear this Lilo and Stitch shirt today, right? God still gives us, and those are hard truths. That's where we just lay and say God's greater than us because we don't want a God who we can perfectly understand because then he'd be like us. He'd be sinful like us. He'd be able to be comprehended by our human brains. 
But thanks be to God, he's way bigger than us and way better than us and way more perfect. And he understands even what we can't. And the way one Psalm puts it, he says, we should be like a little baby in a mother's arms. Because what does a little baby do? A little baby just trusts, right? Just trusts. Even though he doesn't know everything or she doesn't know everything, mom knows better. And mom knows what that baby actually needs. That's how God is with us, okay? So hopefully that helps. But if you have any more questions about it, ask me outside of class, okay? But that is a good connection to this. So no, God doesn't choose anyone to go to hell. We'll get into that another time. Maybe some of you have already been catechism for a while. I'll talk about predestination, right? Where God chose us before the beginning of the world. You know, it's written in the book of life. But he, the logic says, well, that means he chose some to go to hell. But the Bible says, no, that's not the case. And once again, we just go, but God, people choose hell, but God chooses, chooses his people. And so that's what Pharaoh did. He chose to reject God over and over. And eventually God said, okay, have it your way. So we're doing really well on time still, I think. So what happened? God destroyed much of the land with hail in the seventh plague. We're going to fly through these so that we can look at your tests. I'm actually going to make good on the promise for once. So here in the in the in this play, I told you to read a really cool verse, the highlights. It said this in, in 916. It said, But I have raised you up. He's talking about Pharaoh. God's saying this, but I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power, and that my name might be proclaimed through all the earth. So just like we were talking about, like William was saying, God knows everything, and he allows Pharaoh to come to power so that one day he can show his power in an amazing way like these plagues. And what do we talk about the most every Sunday at church this day? Matt, who do you think we talk about the most every Sunday? What do you, first thing that comes to your head, what do we talk about all the time in church the most probably? Well, yeah, God, but more specifically, Sila? Yeah, his forgiveness. I think about every sermon we talk about Jesus dying on the cross. That's where we saw his salvation, right? And what he did for us. Well, these plagues and God bringing his people out of Egypt in the Old Testament before Jesus came, that was like that for them. So just like God said, this showed his power. People would talk about this. They wrote songs about it. They celebrated it. They had big celebrations. We're going to get to the castle over the next this week, we get to look at that at home. But yeah, they celebrated this, sang about it, they preached about it, and he saves them, just like how God saves us through Jesus' death and forgiveness he gives us. And so that's why we talk about that, but this was what they talked about the most. Okay, so let's quick keep going through here. So this is the special verse, but I've raised you up for this very purpose. So who is affected by the plague? Same thing, everyone except the Israelites. And this time, some people, some Egyptian Egyptians actually got out of it too. Those who listened to the warning. All right, hopefully you got the gist of that one. How did Pharaoh react to the plague? This time, he goes back to his old tricks. Oh, he slept them again? Yeah. Oh. First, he admitted he was wrong, and he offered to let the Israelites go. But when the hail stopped, he changed his mind again. But at this point, we know God's heart in his heart, so we shouldn't be surprised. But now we see why. Even though he knew he was going to still do the plagues, we saw that verse we just looked at. He raised him up for this purpose. So like you said, Matt, it's really confusing. It's like, what? God did it now? And so the last plague couldn't even happen. But now it makes sense. Why? Because he still wanted the opportunity to show his power. All the Israelites and the Egyptians. And look back at that last question. If some of the Egyptians are listening to the warning, that means they're probably trusting in Jesus. 
or trusting in God, I should say. They may not know who Jesus is going to be yet, the Messiah, but they, yeah. right? They're trusting in God. They see his power. All right. So he changed his mind again. Psych, you can write. We'll go fast. Next one was locusts. Just write locusts. That can be your, your summary. Locusts. So like the flies and the gnats, they were everywhere. But locusts are even worse because they eat more crops. Who was affected by the plague? This one did the whole land of Egypt. All right. How did Pharaoh react? Ask for forgiveness, but when the locusts were gone, God hardened his heart again. So even further hardening his heart beyond hope. And if that scared you earlier, guys, let's remember the forgiveness Jesus gives us. If you are feeling guilt and worrying, oh no, have I rejected God and is he hard in my heart? The very fact that you're feeling that way shows that he has. Right? You wouldn't be feeling guilty if your if your heart was gone. Think of how Pharaoh didn't he just pretended to, but God does not just do this really nilly. He doesn't just go around saying, Oh, that guy sinned, hard hearted, heart hearted. That guy doesn't believe in me anymore. He used to believe in me in grade school, but now he's in college. All right, heart hearted. No, God doesn't do that. Think of all the chances he gave Pharaoh. But it is still something to be careful about. Okay, as you go out in your life. Here you're at church and you're surrounded by God's word as you guys get older and go to college, college and things like that. It's going to be hard. But remember these warnings that we don't want to reject God because God wants relationship with us. He wants to save us. And we don't want to keep rejecting him so that he has to say, I tried and now I'm going to push you away. All right. Final play. All of Egypt became dark. What? And it was so dark that it could be felt. We don't really understand how that all works. But have you guys ever been in complete pitch darkness before? Um, I think like a little bit. Do you kind of get what this is coming from, that you gave? The darkness is going to be felt. When you're in complete and utter pitch darkness, you just feel different. Your senses start to get mixed up. Your ears even, like your hearing. Like, it's a little weird. It's just, that's kind of, I think, what's getting at here is it was so dark that it started messing with their senses. So, it's just dark. So dark. So you can't do like, anything. Like, Wait, so it's just like, it's just not nighttime, but there's no star or moon. Yeah, and I'm guessing it probably, it couldn't have been as dark as it says unless their lights didn't work either. God probably didn't even let any flames happen. Probably just in Egypt. Yeah. Wouldn't that be crazy? Yeah, maybe. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And there you have it. I, I was hoping that you would say that, Ethan, because look, everyone but the Israelites experienced it. We can't comprehend how that would be. Maybe they can see it in this distance. Yeah, well, it says they had light. So in some way they had light, probably not night vision, like I said, but they had light. That they, that, that yeah. Yeah, you're onto it, Max. It's all speculation. I like your speculation, though. All right, let's go ahead. Go ahead. It could have been like that. Mm -hmm. That's what some people think about, that God maybe sent a special dust storm or something. All right, let's get to the key questions. The last one was that 
that he did the same thing as always, you know, classic Pharaoh stuff. He hardened, but this time it was God. God was again hardening his heart. He rejected him so many times. And this time Pharaoh was really mad. So we can see the results of God hardening the heart. Now he's not even pretending to be guilty. He's just mad and angry. So key questions. What did God do to attempt to convince Pharaoh to let his people go from their slavery in Egypt? Pretty easy. Selah. Plagues. God sent plagues. You guys can get that. If you don't get them all down today, we'll start next time by making sure you got these key questions. What did Pharaoh do to his heart after each plague? Yeah, he hardened or in our words, he said, man, he said, psych. He hardened and wouldn't listen to God. Very good. Key question C. What did God eventually do to Pharaoh's heart? Hardened it. So you guys could do those questions without the, without the PowerPoint because you know it. And notice this, though. It says, and put Pharaoh beyond hope because that's what that means. In the New Testament, that's called the sin against the Holy Spirit. It seems like those two are very related. You guys ever talked about that in catechism before? Maybe once or twice? We'll, we'll get to it again some, some other time. But Okay. There is a lesson for us in Pharaoh's meetings with Moses. What can happen when we continually despise God's word? That's what we're supposed to be doing, but when we're not doing that and completely reject in God. See that? Yeah, he could keep, we kill our own faith by doing that. God will eventually say, okay, that's what you want. But again, that's a scary thing. But I also want you guys to leave on God's promises. He says, I will hold you always in the palm of my hand. Jesus, the good shepherd says, my sheep know my voice. You guys know his voice. You're not in danger of being hardened right now or any. And it's just something to be aware of, though, to know that God takes it seriously. He wants our faith to be in him. And everything he does is motivated by love. So the reason he warns us today that it's very serious and hardening is a real thing is because he doesn't want us to go running away rejecting him. He wants us to keep trusting in him. And he will, he will be with us. Okay? So I'll hand you your test just for a few minutes here. Oh, I have to again. Sorry. I'm freaking out. Well, that's a We totally forgot to pray at the start again, too. I was going to pray an axe prayer at the start. So let's pray now, just in case people got to get going, because I will email you guys. I think I emailed your mom your test already, Gabe. I don't know if I emailed your mom, Charlie, with your test. I'll have to check. But uh, let's say a prayer for those who need to leave. Here we go. Lord God, thank you so much for teaching us through your word tonight. When we see you hardening Pharaoh's hearts, we can maybe become afraid and think, what if you harden our hearts when we reject you and when we sin? But help us to know that you are always with us. You hold us in the palm of your hand and you will help us. You will you will not harden our hearts because you give us trust in you. But help us not to reject you one day, but always believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.